my name is Joseph Carlson, and this is episode 161 of Gaming with Grief, and I'm calling this episode 1979 Revolution Black Friday Spoiler Review. But I want to remind you guys that this podcast will hit my website, www.gamingwithgrief.com, Monday morning at 7 a.m. Please go there, leave a comment, let me know what you think of the show. You can write to me at gwgpodfellows at gmail.com. You can, again, let me know what you think of the show, leave a comment, maybe there's a game you want me to review. You can also subscribe to the podcast on Apple iTunes, the Google Play Store, Spotify. Old episodes are also going up on YouTube. I'm very close to being caught up, so it'll be day and date with the podcast. And you can find me on Twitter at JustLittleJoe. So yeah, this is just a follow-up to episode uh, 159, where I did my early impressions of a game called 1979 Revolution Black Friday. Um, I kind of gave, you know, who made the game and things like that during that section, so I won't go over that. But I really, really like this game. I think this is, uh, you know, when, when people say that games are trash or they don't understand, or especially uh, a lot of the media uh, will blame games for certain things if there's a violent outbreak or something, uh, or whatever. It, gaming is a scapegoat for a lot of uh, organizations when they don't understand games. And I think this is one of the rare instances where, not rare, but one of the growing instances where games are becoming more um, informative. Like, I don't know a lot about Iran. <laughs> it's going to be pretty straightforward. Um, this game does a really good job of setting up the stakes, the people, uh, you're basically a young photographer and you, um, and you know what? I should have written down the name of the main character, but you're a photographer kind of coming back home. It sounds like you were going to school in Germany. I played the game in big chunks and I took a break between the middle, the, the middle chunk and the end chunk when I finished the game, which is kind of sad because it's only a two hour game. But you're basically playing a photographer. You come back from Germany. It sounds like you're going to school. You meet a friend, and there is already a people in the streets uh, of Iran. The Shah is in trouble, I guess. People are protesting him. I mean, these are basically the broad strokes, but I'll say this. Uh, you know, you can decide what kind of person you want to be through the revolution. I really like there was some choice. You know, do you want to be violent like your cousin, or uh, do you want to be like your other friends that are trying to be nonviolent? You uh, go to a nonviolent protest, um, but uh, you can choose to be violent and, uh, you know, help people or hurt people, which I really enjoyed. And one thing I really enjoyed is, like I said in my impressions, that the more I dug into the game, I wish there was a little bit more on the back end, but it seemed like it was kind of front loaded uh, where there was learn more about and they made it look like a file where you would learn about the uh they, they would, you know, they, they did like a uh, facsimile of a picture in the game. So like you'd look at a street and see a rendered car on fire and take a picture of it. And then they'd show the real picture from the real revolution of there was a car on fire that looked a lot like that. And I really like this. In fact, I just uh, a week ago or whatever, I found out it's it's good for me to pick up at the library. But it's it's about kind of the revolution is coming, but it's more about... Uh, Iran versus Syria and the Middle East, like that whole situation, how those people, uh, well, the governments and people interact with one which, with one another to lead to the um, the revolution. Um, it's amazing to see. I think when we think of the Middle East, we think of uh, uh, Islam. And what I what I really like, uh, that's incredibly stereotypical. I'm not one of the people that thinks that like. Muslims or Islam is bad. It's just I think we think of a theocracy, you know, which it seems like it was in different time periods. Again, this is me trying to learn a little bit and read a little bit. I'll probably know much more when I read the book when it talks about the region. Uh, let me shout out the book really quick because I, uh, it's called Black Wave, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and the Forty Year Rivalry, uh, and the Forty Year Rivalry that um, I can't say rivalry. Anyway, um, the. Um, title got cut off in my notice. Anyway, it's by uh, G- Kim Gatiss. Um, it was very high. It came very highly recommended. Uh, definitely, if you want to learn more, like I am about the revolution, I-, I just want to learn more about the region. But but back to my point, what I thought was interesting about this, it 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 showed the tension that there, just like in every country, and I I know this in my heart that a country is not the government, you know, and that there are people. Um, 
there, and I guess this kind of mirrors America in a way, you know, lately in America, there's been this big push for like the Christian right and people that are maybe atheists or aren't religious, this kind of push and pull between, uh, you know, what the Christian right believes is important or fundamental to America and what secular people believe is fundamental. And, and I think this highlights that even though we speak a different language and maybe have different beliefs about culture and how we grow up, everything's the same everywhere. There is a group of people in Iran at the time that are secular saying, listen, we can't do this. But some people are very religious saying this is our culture. You know, we have to um, we have to adhere to this and other people trying to break away, you know, and the fact that they're, you know, when you 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 mix religion with money and all that. And, and it just shows that it is a terrible situation, you know, and um and I'll just say this, I don't want to get too political on my, because uh, I have another podcast for that when I get political. But one thing I've really come to realize over the past couple of weeks reading the news, you know, the world is a horrible place sometimes. But what I've kind of realized is that when, when, when you're, one, I've learned that rights aren't uh, ordained by God. Uh, you know, everybody, whatever you believe in, a creator or a higher power, they don't give us rights. Uh, governments uh, give us rights. And, uh, you know, because we, we allow ourselves to be represented by government. Now, I, I'm going to be totally apolitical. I'm just saying, you know, what I feel about that. Governments give us rights. So that creates weird things with policy and term limits and who's in office and how those rights can be literally taken away, especially if you're uh, a minority or someone who is an other, I'll say, without getting... I mean, this is, I guess, the political part of the podcast. But this is a political game. I mean, this whole idea of religion and secularism and the economy and these oil workers going on strike, like I mentioned in the quick look, like all these things kind of coming together to create a true, you know, um, just a true tension in, in in the country. And like, you know, some people may have been spies for the shot and like who's looking. And, and there was a really weird part of the game where, you think that like you know the government has a spy in your um organization when you you know you're you're kind of the youth you're trying to upend the you know the regime and um there's this moment where you have to decide uh who the spy is and i didn't really like that because i spent time looking at things and reading things and learning about the iranian revolution and not really listening to there was only a few lines of dialogue someone roughs you up uh, one of the members of your uh, of the revolutionary groups gets stabbed, and you have to like finger the person who did it. And I didn't know. Uh, at the end, they tell you your choice, and they're like, "You chose this person that was the uh, the turncoat." And I'm like, oh, "Okay." Uh, I mean, I know who I chose. I will say that my only um, big um, kind of negative about the game is I understand with games with choices, they want to kind of put a clock on it because you can't just sit there thinking forever like what you're going to say. But it, this, the clock seemed too quick. Like you had maybe three seconds. And uh, I would be like, okay, what? Do, how do I want to play this? Do I want to be, you know, violent, nonviolent? Do I want to take the picture and not take the picture? I'm a photographer. It's important. People need to see the revolution. And I'd be reading that. And I think I'm a pretty quick reader. But I was also trying to judge my choices against my other choices and being somewhat consistent based on the situation. Like, what would a human being do? You know, if your family comes to you and says, yeah, let's be violent. Let's get a gun. But your friend's like, there's another way. We don't have to be violent. What do you want to do? Um... I think the choi- the the timer was too quick where I'd be like, mm, I don't know what to, oh, look, I already made my mind. Okay, I guess I'm saying nothing. Uh, that part was really uh, weird to me. Um, quick. But, but all this stuff shows a great amount of tension in the situation. And I think that, uh, again, like I said, I've been reflecting on this reading the news that, you know, rights are given by the government and uh, everywhere, everywhere is getting to the point where no matter who is in charge or what, what, uh, uh, what political party is charge? Um, this kind of came as epiphany. I've said it before in the podcast, but I'm going to share it again. So people have been listening for a while. You're probably sick of the story. I've said it a few times. So uh, when my mom was sick and in the hospital, you know, uh, she was working part time, didn't have a lot of money. I was trying to get a social worker involved because I was paying her mortgage while she was in the hospital and I was paying my mortgage. That was incredibly expensive. I was racking up a lot of credit card debt. And the fact that you get rejected and all this stuff... And so I was trying to get a social worker involved to help, just please help me with what's going on. I don't know what to do financially. Uh, Luckily, uh, we got a social worker. We turned in some paperwork. But I was reading this article when my mom was in the hospital in our local paper about 
uh, I forget what it was. I think it was the American Care Act, the ACA. Everybody calls it Obamacare. But some of these benefits were going away in certain states, and I think in our state, or something was changing. And this op-ed guy wrote, uh, I don't know his name. I just remember the gist of the article, which was like, listen, once you give someone something, it's very, especially as a government, it's very difficult to take that away. And I don't think, I want to be very clear, I don't think this is a, this is a message of entitlement. You know, I've heard a lot of people say, well, you're not entitled to anything, which I guess, cool. Uh, that's, I guess, a discussion for another time. But you know, you know what, say I'm not entitled or are entitled or whatever. Once a government says, this is what we're doing for you as a government, and they say, okay, so this is something we're giving you, like Medicare. Oh, your benefits are going away. It's very difficult to take things away once they've been given, you know. Um, imagine if everybody, uh, you know, we can vote when we're 18. Imagine if they, because the voting age used to be 21, and it was argued, uh, I've seen clips, it was argued on the Senate floor, we need to lower it to 18 because we can send people to war, but they can't vote. Um Imagine if all of a sudden somebody wrote a bill that said, uh, no, actually, we're going to move it back to 21 because 18-year-olds really don't know enough about the world to vote. And I think uh, there would be massive, massive upheaval. Uh, hopefully, that would be enough to have people protest and, um, you know, go to city hall, t- you know, uh, whatever, go to state legislatures, uh, protest, all that kind of stuff I think would be important. But... The, what I'm trying to get at in a very uh, long roundabout way is that if you give someone the right to vote or the right to choose what they wear or what they read or what they think when it comes to religion, and then someone comes along, and this is every country, but it really uh, became apparent during this game. When you start giving people the ability to go to university and read what they want to read, and I've seen early pictures before the revolution in the Middle East of people just going to the beach. And again, if you have a kind of a narrow view of the Middle East and think that it's always been under some kind of weird regime where it's religious and people can't think what they want to think, that's all not true. And to see them kind of go back to this way, um, it's really sad and to see this tension, and, and you know, again, people were killed in this revolution. The government opened fire with, uh, I think, M16s, like on protesters. It wasn't tear gas; they were real bullets. People died, you know. And it's, it's one of the things here, you know. No matter what I believe, again, this is kind of the most. I mean, this is a political game, so I guess I'm going to be political. No matter what I think about Trump, uh, I I don't understand. I I want someone to explain. When, uh, you know, w- what Make America Great means again. Because I, I think in a way, we've had problems throughout time being, um, being, living up to the ideals that we set out when we became a nation. Uh, I think from the jump, we didn't do that. We didn't do the things we said we were going to do, you know, and I think that's a problem. And I think... In this game, it's definitely exemplified by the fact that there is three, basically, factions, from what I can tell. You have the working class, uh, you know, saying, you know, let's take to the streets, oil refineries shut down. I mean, I said that in the thing, but I was kind of blown away where there was, like, these massive walkouts and the fact that the workers have these rights. And there were students who were, like, reading, you know, and, 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 and reading history, and they weren't, it sounds like they were able to get some material that they were able to read and kind of have, like, a free flow of ideas. Like, is this how we want our future to go? And you had religious people saying we need to at least keep some form of religion going in our country. We need to keep our religion as part of our identity. We need to keep this going and people responded to that it's saying it's too it's too much it's too from what i can read so far without reading this book from what i'm reading from this game and seeing the thing it's like is this too restrictive are we being too restrictive on ourselves like all that kind of stuff it's like fascinating to me where you and, and i mean you see it in america now again you have secular people you have christian people you have people that are you know far right that want to literally uh protest 
uh, with Tiki Torches a few years ago, and even nowadays, uh, after recording this, there was a U-Haul of uh, white supremacists that were busted in Idaho for wanting to break up a pride rally because it's Pride Month. And of course, I'm glad they were... Um, you know, I'm glad they were caught before anything would happen. Also, just to be totally fair, if somebody threatened the life of a Supreme Court justice, I want that person tried and uh, brought to justice. I don't want anything bad to happen to our Supreme Court justices because you disagree with a verdict. Now, you know, again, whatever I believe politically, I don't want harm to come to people. I really think nonviolence is the way because, uh, I mean, a sp- Spoiler for an episode that's coming out soon. Uh, Avin and I on our other podcast, The Grief of Politics, talk about uh, domestic terrorism. We talk about how uh, we read an article, I believe by The Atlantic, but basically these things beget other things. So if you're violent towards one faction, they will use that as justification to be violent towards you. And it just is a cyclical thing that it's so cliche to say that violence is a cycle and all this, but it's true. The moment you use violence against somebody, then... Uh, they will use violence against you and be able to justify anything that happens. And I think you saw this during the revolution. You know, the people took to the streets. They tried to be less violent. But there were some people that were former police or former military that said, you know, we need to fight force with force. And, uh, you know, it was bloody. And uh, the structure of the game to flash back between the main character, um, you know, being interrogated by... Uh, you know, a religious fanatic basically saying, tell me what happened, rat these people out. I want to see your photos. You know, you don't understand what's going on. And for you to kind of break down, you know, there's a big revelation in there. They bring your brother in who is a police officer. They torture him in front of you. And, you know, your your, uh, captor who's torturing him says, if you don't tell me what I want to know, I'm going to hurt your brother. And he does repeatedly over and over again. And then towards the end, you realize that your brother was in on it. And because they want to know where all these revolutionaries are and you have to rat them out. And I didn't rat the people out that I was with because I never got along with my brother in the game. You know, you have obviously choices you can make to, uh, you know, which way you want to go. If you want to be violent, nonviolent, who you want to help, who you want to side with, stuff like that. And my brother just kept roughing me up. And again, we're family and he's got a job to do, but like, I don't know. It seemed weird. You know, he never want it, it, the the things I remember my brother is there was very few times where he wanted to talk things out. He usually just roughed me up in the street and then, you know, berated me. We went to dinner with the folks. He berated me there. I mean, you know, it's rough. There's a great little scene towards the end of the game where you go to dinner, you have a big fight with your brother. He walks out. Your mom and dad are still there talking. They're very sad because you guys have a fight at dinner. Obviously, it's a normal thing, you know. Well, can we just have dinner? We don't want to fight. We just want to have dinner. Um, But your dad says, listen, like the the power goes out and your dad says, "Ah, go get me a flashlight and stuff and some batteries. And he looks at you and he says, listen, this is just like it was when I was a kid. It's rough, but just keep your head down. Which, in my opinion, kind of meant that he was kind of on the side of the revolutionaries. Like he's like, you know, yeah, okay, I get it. Just quietly do what you got to do and get out of here. You know, and it's moments like that. There's even uh, anonymous photos they use in the thing, which I thought was amazing, where they showed um, photos from someone and they said they were anonymous of the people that they used in the game. So it was a real photo, but then they turned them into characters in the game and they had them, these anonymous photos, they had them throughout the years. So they could say, here's, you know, Bobby and whoever at this old and um then they're at the beach and then they're doing this and it was like oh this is really really cool um i i don't know on their website and i didn't see it i wish there was something that said that there was a you know like some kind of resource where i could um i could maybe read like i had to do my own digging for the book that i'm gonna read and try to learn more about the revolution but again it's games like this that really kind of teach you something and teach you that, um, you know, like made me want to learn more about the revolution. And this is what games can do. You can take a subject matter that you're not familiar with and say, let me show you what happened in this slice of life or how these people were feeling or what was going on in this moment at this time. And I think 
that is a great thing that games can do, and I'm glad this game did it. Uh, like I said in the preview thing, it won awards, so I'm very happy for it to do that. Um, you know, that at least got some recognition for what it did. Uh, the studio went on to do some kind of Nor game. I don't know what that's all about, but I probably will check that out. Um, I wish they did more weird games like this. I will say this is a weird aside, but Assassin's Creed uh, just celebrated an anniversary. I'm not the biggest Assassin's Creed fan, but one thing they've been doing for years is taking their ancient settings of going to Egypt and Rome and Greece, and they've been doing these discovery things where you don't fight. You download it. It's a free experience, and you basically become a whatever, a civilian, peasant, whatever, in the, the land, and you just walk around, and they have these little things. Oh, this guy is a blacksmith, and this is what they did. Uh, they're basically using the research that they did for the game to present it in like an educational thing. There's even a trailer for educators to get a hold of them so they can get a hold of these tools. The newest game, Valhalla, is about the Vikings, and they uh, said that this is all free, and that they're making the other ones free, like Egypt. I think the other one was um, Ancient Greece. All those are becoming free. They're a free download experience. Just for educational purposes, I might look at them. Uh, I probably won't talk about them on the podcast. But it is kind of neat that people are using games literally as an educational tool. And uh, like this game, you l will learn something about something you weren't familiar with. So I definitely recommend it. Uh, again, I don't have a scale. And no one cares about my podcast. So... <laughs> But I will recommend it's only about a two-hour experience. Uh, so please check out 1979 Revolution Black Friday. Uh, I ranted a little, but that happens sometimes. This is my podcast. I can do what I want. Uh, but I think that'll end it for this week, guys. I think that's it. And ladies and people. But uh, I want to remind you guys that this podcast will hit my website, www.gamewithgrief.com, Monday morning at 7 a.m., Please go there and let me know what you think of the show. You can also write to me at gwgpodfellows at gmail.com. Again, write to me. Let me know what you think of the show. If you want me to review a game or you want me, you know, you have a question to ask, you can do that. You can also subscribe to the podcast on either Apple iTunes, the Google Play Store. You can find me on Spotify and old episodes are going up on YouTube. I think I'm up to episode 140 right now or 141. I will try to get those out next week. I'm usually doing about three a day, so I'll be caught up pretty quick. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. I think that's it. Um, I'm trying to get Wes back on. He was a friend of mine. He was on episode 120. He's done with his D&D &D campaign, and I want to talk to him about what it's been like to uh, you know plan a campaign. He's a new father. Just kind of go over that. I think he said he listened to the episode, too, and he said, man, you know, it's one of those things where, oh, yeah, I thought I knew so much until 40 weeks later I learned so much about DMing. So that's coming up in the next few weeks. Um, and uh, you guys have a good week. I will talk to you again next week.